This is a presentation from the Wapanka Historical Society. So this year is the 150th anniversary of the railroad coming to Wapanka. So we wanted to do something special for that. And so that's why we're having this program. We were going to, like you said, we were going to have this potato bake. And I had made up this program a few years ago when we were going to do a program here. And, and I took out the part about the potato stuff and switched to the other program. But, but now we're doing that, so then I switched things around a little bit, but I left the potato part out for another program. But, so anyway, I'm pretty informal with all this. But I wanted to read the story before we get going. It was in the Wapaka County Post in 1947 talking about what it was like before the train came here and the day that the first train arrived. It's just a, a little newspaper story in here. I thought it was pretty interesting. It says, supply is hard to get. Of course, I've been talking about the way farmers used to live, but there were other people who had to buy things from stores, and there were lots of lumber camps around the country then that had to have supplies. Now just think what an awful job it was to get staples and hardware and lots of other things that were needed up into this country and further west in the lumber sections like Stevens Point before the railroad came. It was all shipped up the river as far as Gill's Landing and then towed from there in big old wagons drawn by two teams of horses the rest of the way. It used to take them three days and two nights to make the trip from Gill's Landing to Stevens Point. Just think of it. Of course, they never drove at night. They stayed in taverns along the road. I remember the first tavern they always stayed at on that trip, and that was Emmons Farm. It was interesting, because I used to know Ed Emmons from the Episcopal Church, and he was a member of that family. The Emmons Farm is on rural road, you know, the rustic route, road out towards rural, because that was the main highway at one time, before it came this way, when it went through Little Hope and Park and Rural and Rural and all that. Anyway, it, and, the, and the other one was where the old Catholic Church was for many years, up in 54. I guess that might have been somewhere near St. Pat's, an old church there. Yes, sir, those old tote teams were on the road all the time, going back and forth from Gill's Landing. That is, until the railroad came, the old Wisconsin Central. My, but wasn't it a big day for Wapaka, the day the tracks were laid that far, going west. I was just a young shaver, about seven or eight years old, but I remember it like it was yesterday. It was in the middle of the winter. <clears throat> what a terrible cold day. Mother bundled me up all in buffalo robes, and father and I drove to town on the sleigh. The depot wasn't where it is now, up on the hill. It was down the hill on this side of the tracks, on the same side of the street. Everybody from all over the country was there to see that train pull in. It is, as you could, if you could call it a train, <laughs> that is, if you could call it a train. There was only a great big old steam engine and smokestack about eight feet high and one car. But there were plenty of excitement, I tell you. We could hear it coming as far before we saw it because it started whistling when it left Waiwiga. <laughs> so everybody had a chance to get all worked up before it ever came in sight. And of all the hollering and yelling you ever heard, it was the worst. <laughs> and the fights. I don't know how they got started, just the excitement, I guess, but there were plenty of them. Regular rough and tumble ones, too, with lots of bloody noses thrown in. You know, Wapak is very nearly didn't get that railroad. It was surveyed to go through rural in the first place and took a lot of arguing, arguing, and I guess a lot of wire pulling to get the company to change the route. But they finally did. Yes, sir, the old Wisconsin Central. Hi, what a fine railroad it used to be. Well, it was one of my finest in the Northwest for many years. So I thought that was kind of a fun story to tell about the first train arriving here. I got a little bit of other text at the beginning here, but uh, mostly I got pictures. So, okay, this is, like I say, I just, before I decided to read this, I put this one here, and it talks about the, David, David Leader was the one that wrote the Wapakinus Railroads books. But this story is one he took out of the newspaper, because I also saw that story, so I know where he got it from. Amid the, amid the cheers and celebrations, the first iron ore started in Opaca, cold Thursday evening, September 28, 1871. They keep talking about cold and being yeah, bundled up September. in September, <laughs> a little different than this year. No, I'm going to, you, can you hear me OK? Yep. Then I can do it when I'm ready, so. Okay. okay. 
And then here they talk about it, it says the fist fights broke out with bloody noses, the same thing. And yet, this is a different newspaper story, because in fact they had more than one newspaper at the time. The train consisted of single engine and passenger car, heard long forms appearance, the whistle, why we done all. And then it says, the years of waiting paid off, and Opaka would no longer be thought of as a sleepy little town on Opaka River. A new era has dawned in this pleasant village. Now let's sing the praise of the Wisconsin Central Railroad Company. Their name is Energy, their motto forward, and their wish Godspeed to the end. So those old newspaper stories, they really had some colorful language. They're kind of interesting to, to see. And so then on Monday, on the next Monday, mixed trains of freight and passenger cars were running between Wapaka and Manasha. So I was wondering why, when I first saw the story, it talked about, it was the first, in October when the first train was, but then I realized that they were talking about this train, the first official timetable, and the other one was the first passenger train that actually came on the 28th. So, yeah, now look at that. You know, that story I just read, it took three days to get to, from Gill's Landing to Stevens Point. And here, this tra train with a smoking car for passengers left Manasha at 7 a.m. and arrived in Opec at 10.45 a.m. A respectable <coughs> 10 miles an hour. Yeah. The train traveled to 34.47 mi uh, miles in three hours and 45 minutes. So it took them just under four hours. Uh, yeah, so, and that was, that was pretty fast at that time. So it's interesting how things change. The line was quickly completed to Stevens Point by December 2nd. A train was running through between Stevens Point and Menasha daily except Sunday. And the freight train was available three times a week. The first railroad facility in Opac consisted of a 30 by 71 foot single story wooden freight frame depot, a wooden, a wa wooden water tank, and a windmill. These facilities were located on a passing track north of the main line. First shipments were flour, livestock, and hardwood lumber. This was soon the same change drastically with increased farming. But this is the part I, I took out about the potato bake because we were going to have that other program. But the program is still plenty long. So. Anyway, there's no pictures of that first wooden depot where it was located. It was on this side of the tracks, just down there, just <coughs> down the other side of the road. So, but the, they said that the Waiwinga depot was pretty much the same as the Wapaka depot, that first one. So here's a picture of the Waiwinga depot. Yeah, but on, on this side, you know, so yeah. So that gives you an idea what, what it first looked like. Then I got a few more. What they did, when they built the, the newer depot, they took and moved over this old depot to the other side of the tracks, about where the freight house. So, uh, so this shows after it got moved. That's the original depot when it, after it became a freight house and they had the bigger depot. And there's the trolley line that came to the end of the, to the, end, to the, edge of the bridge there. We'll talk about that a little more. And here, I kind of like this picture. There it shows that old wooden depot that, that was, became the freight house. And that, where more Matic is right across there now was a lumber shed. And then the Central Hotel is just over the top of the lumber shed. You hear about the Central Hotel, that, named after the Wisconsin Central, people stopping to spend the night there. OK, and here, this is the depot, that, that bigger depot that was opened in 1881. So that was down, that they located that adult, down where the freight house is now, you know, across the street by the bowling alley. That's where that was. And we found some of the foundations for it when I was laying the track for the caboose. There was foundation stones in there. So we had to dig down a little bit so, from that depot. Then in the year 1900, they um, put this grade in here, this bank, this, where that's higher up now. With a, so that's a picture of them putting in the grade. That's kind of interesting, the newspaper stories about it. You know, after coming out of bankruptcy in 1899, the WC began a massive rebuilding project to reduce grades and curves between Nina and Stevens Point. The curve near Elm Street was realigned, dirt was removed to be used to elevate the tracks near the depot. So if you go just down that way, there's a cut along Elm Street, and that's where this was taken, that picture. The old steam shovel they had then. 
So the ponderous machinery attracted hundreds to see the big scoop push its nose in the hard gravel among the boulders. It came out two and a half yards of earth as it swings around and deposits the flat car just as easy as a little boy would take up dirt with a spoon. I, I like all these colorful languages that you did back then. It only takes about three scoops to fill the car and the unloading is done by immense plow pulled the length of the car by a cable attracted to the engine. So they would have, this plow would run down the length of the train you know, the cars would be fastened in place and then the engine would pull a plow head with a cable and that's how the, everything would get pushed off of the car. It was kind of interesting. That's the modern way. It's quite a contrast to Patty in the wheelbarrow a few years ago. Strong visitors have been attracted to the steam shuttle, especially at night. A crew under engineer Frank Miles keeping the work up by electric and gasoline light lamp all night. So there. Oops, I went the wrong way there. Okay, then this picture, it's um, when, I, when I first got it, it's the trolley line in Wapaka, and you see that guardrail up above? That's the old, that's the bridge right after they raised the bank. Just the Oak Street Bridge. So, and there's actually two freight cars in the picture going across at the lower level. It's the only picture I know that even has a hint of showing what the old wooden bridge was over Oak Street that was there for six years. Okay, when they built the, when they built the um, bank, the, the depot was over, the passenger station was over where the freight house is. Now, you know, now. So what they did was they moved it over to where more Manic is now, just across that street for the first year. It says it was temporarily moved across Oak Street to make room for the old wooden freight house, which was a move over to where the freight house is now because they built this big bank here and they had to move it. And then, so the WC offered to move the freight and passenger depots to the west, having the advantage of being one third nearer to the business district and with a prettier view of downtown. In other words, probably down by Holbeck Street or Wesley Street, they would have put the depot where it was level ground. Passengers wouldn't be compelled to go up to 14 feet of stairs <coughs> to take the train. And then it says no consensus of the location was reached by community members, and the trolley line had been built to the depot just the year before. So the old depot was moved across the street the following year, and then they across the tracks and put it up here in, in um, 1901. Irving Lord had just built the trolley line, and he was pretty much against moving the, I mean, he spent lots and lots of money to build this trolley line and, and the depot was kind of going to the, a different location the following year so he was one of them that was against it and he was pretty influential at the time. But then in 1907 it says the fire started on the roof. One of the stories said they thought it started from sparks from a steam engine but nobody really knew for sure. And because there was not enough water pressure in, in the city of Wapaka the the fire burned. By then they had put this, this awning over the, by the track side and around there and kind of remodeled it a little bit when they moved it up here. So there's another picture of it on fire yeah, from the other direction. So then, I don't know if I need to read all this stuff, but so then they decided to build this building and Wisconsin something would come out of bankruptcy again and they were wanting to put up a fancier depot. You know, it's already getting to be a tourist town and everything. We're just kind of speculating how they, well, Packy got such a nice depot. So, but they did, you know. And, um, and this talks about, and it says it was built out of Chippewa Falls sandstone, so that's why I know what, where the stone came from. And then it talks about, you know, the carpenters and painters finished the station. No, it looks as bright as a newly blossomed daisy, a new station. <laughs> One of the finest stations on the central line. The outside woodwork is painted dark green, and the interior trim is a polished oil finish, which is what I went back to now. I went back to the original interior colors. The ticket's office and operating room are commodious and well-lighted. There's a large general waiting room from the fireplace, with fireplace, which we're looking at right now. Private parlor and toilet rooms for the ladies adjoining, and a smoking room for the men. Each of the men's and ladies had private rooms 
had private rooms, had fireplaces, I'm sorry. And the side, there's a hot water furnace in the basement, so I know that they had the hot water heat right away. And besides the drawings show the hot water heat system. The baggage room is rather small, but handy to the general waiting room <coughs> for matter checking and receiving suitcases, grips, etc. The whole building is nicely wired with electric lighting. And there's the baggage room over in that corner. You can open the window and there was a counter there on the other side. It didn't have a, a huge opening, but I could see where you could slide a suitcase or, or a package through there or something. Bigger things would have to go around. And the men, well, back in men's business advancement association should hold a sort of a jubilee in honor of this worthy improvement and invite officials to the blowout. <coughs> there, were, there were newspaper articles every week throughout the time they were building this station. It was really interesting reading about the progress of building the station. And I just took a, a little bit of a couple of them to show you here. But it was a big deal in the when they built that new railroad station. The same as when they built the trolley line. There was articles every week about the construction of the trolley. So here's earlier pictures. You can see how small the engine is. And we'll pack a name on there. The semaphore. This is the same picture, it's been colorized. Now, the, when it was Wisconsin Central, the word Wapaka and the station name was a black sign with gold lettering. And after it became Sioux Line, they made a new sign. It was white with black lettering. So one day I was working on, there's some vents in the foundation underneath here. And I took off one of the old vent boards and went through my, my amazement. Here's the P with the black and the gold lettering. Wow. So it was a piece of the old Wapaka sign. I was, I was, even though it just looks like a scrap of wood to maybe most people, to me it's, it's kind of a valuable thing to have. <coughs> yeah, probably a lot of things to. You never know. And this is kind of a neat picture. Now I don't know if that's the way everybody was dressed normally at that time, or if it was something special. You got, some of you probably know better than me about, about that. <coughs> That's an early picture. I got this picture from the Dane's home when it was an antique shop. There was a lady named Beverly who was running it. And she had they gotten that picture in and they wanted like 35 bucks for the picture. It was crazy. And she was thought we had it. So she came to me and said, well, I'll pay for part of it if you get the save for a packet. So, so she paid for half of it and we paid for part of it. And we got the picture. And the, but if you look right, you get my arrow there. See that right there? There's a taxi. It's a horse-drawn taxi with big, with big wooden wheels and fancy. Anyways, that was for the Delavan Hotel. Because I have another picture of that of that wagon showing just the wagon, and it had the hotel name on it. And I can't remember if it was Delavan or Bosberg or Gordon Air at that time. I forgot because it changed names over the years. But that was their hotel taxi to take people down there from the depot. Press the right button here. There's another picture with a smaller steam engine and the, shows the two tracks down below. And you can see the, you can see the um, crushing building there too from the, from the granite quarry way in the back far end. That was their till 1915, I believe, when that when that burned, and the old and the water tower. Another picture. This is the one I used to do that depot drawing with. This is the, the original picture of that kind. That's, I got a copy from somewhere to so learn what they are. And this one's kind of interesting too. Even though it's kind of dark, it shows the water towers, the horse-drawn wagons, and the old original water tower at the lower <coughs> level, the seven four and the freight house over there you can kind of see. So there's a lot of things in that picture. And the, the light, the street light looking thing, that's pretty neat, pretty elaborate with that fancy wrought iron bracket and all on there. So I don't know if that was electric at that time. It probably was. There's another one. You can see the crushing tower in the background there. Yeah. Another colorized picture. Yeah, now, way over on this side, there's a sign. 
And I always wonder what that sign says, but I, I have no idea. It's on the stairway as you come up toward the depot, from going up and down below. <laughs> yeah, watch your. It's quite a long sign, so I don't know. <laughs> what, did, what did she say? No skateboarding. No skateboarding. <laughs> Maybe so. so. Back then there was there was not all that many trees there. It was all wide open, you know, after the area had been logged off. Yeah. And this picture you can see right here, that thing, that pipe there, and then there's another one down here. A lot of when you see railroad water towers, you think of this spout on the side of a water tower that the, would, would come down for the tender. Well, this didn't have that. It was farther from the tracks, and that pipe went underground and went up that, to that water spout, which was swiveled over to, you know, behind the tender to put the water in the steam engines. So they had one on either end of the station, so depending on which direction the train was going, the passenger cars could still be stopped in front of the station, and they could put water in the engine. This is Company C going off to World War I. Busy day there. Lots of emotions, I'm sure. Now this one, you can see the driveway going up the hill. And you know how steep that hill is? And it's, it's even a little steeper now because of when they filled it in for building the bridge. But even then it was so steep. And I can't imagine horse-drawn vehicles going down that steep hill. They must have good brakes on them or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they would do it year-round or what. So, And then at that time, the main street went around the curve, and they had to put the, the county, you know, the highway, out past the trailer park the way it is now, that direction. So that would have been a Redfield Street, I suppose, going that way around. And you can see the stairs going up real well there. Yeah, it's the same steps. Steps are the same. So this is a picture of Charlie Gennetti on the Velocipede. And we have a Velocipede in our baggage, our, our trolley car barn down there. So you can see an actual Velocipede. You sit on there and there's outrigger to the other track and you pump it with your hands and feet. So he, Charlie Gennetti did a lot of things. He was a farmer. And his daughter was Yolanda Perry, who I was with pretty well known in the city council for a while, for quite a while. So she, she gave me this picture and another one, and this one too. There he is again, he is the guy with the bibs, third from the right. I'm trying to figure out what that is he's holding, but I just can't quite, if anybody's got any guesses. And it looks like, there's, it looks to me like they're standing in, there's a, a hood of a truck or something here. I'm trying, that's what it looks like to me. I don't, but I don't know for sure. What, what is this whole thing here? I, don't, I, I almost thought it was a cowling, but, but that <coughs> advanced itself. So there you can see the freight house there, pretty good in that picture. And I'm guessing that's from the teens or early 20s or something. It's still got the, the black Wapaka name on it, so it's pretty early. Probably the teens. Getting a little more recent here. Now, I don't know if that's an inspector's car or a railroad official's car or what, but it says Sioux Line on it, yep. And some uh, old car buff told me that was a 37 Ford, so I believe him. <laughs> and he's, look at the guy at working at the depot. He's wearing the same looking uniform that I am today. So, yeah, and the hat too, so yeah. So, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Are there ribs on the inside of those tires, or would you be just driving on? There's uh, special railroad yeah, flanges on those wheels. Those look like flanges on the to hold it on. Yeah, there's, yeah, those are have special flanges on. I think they're probably special wheels they just are, for that. They, they used to have to change the whole tire off, basically. You took the regular tires off. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, seems, yeah, like it would have to be what it is, yeah. R70 and Blake in there. 
for her. Then it was well, just the car number. The railroad, the railroad even numbered their, their vehicles. Yeah. I don't know what stuff is for her. That's right, yeah. And there's a, it's a little newer picture of that car and at the top is more, a, little, a little more recent. But then if you look way over on this side, that's the bridge that went over the Wopatka Green Bay River, the Green Bay Western. So you can see it way off in the distance there. And you can see how open everything is. There's not much for trees. Two railroads in the city? Yes, there were. Actually, if you count the trolley line, there were three. And if you count the Brickyard Railroad, there were four. So, yeah. The, that's another whole story. I could put on another whole program about the Apache Green Bay Railroad. So we could do another program then. And I have another program about the trolley line, too. So, so another time we could do all those. Now this one is interesting to me, too. I look at all these details in the pictures. Now if you look over here, there's the old pickle plant factory, the old Squire Dinging Pickle Station right there. And that's the only picture I have of that pickle station. Sure. Or dingy, or what I always hear, dinging, I don't know. So anyway, I'm happy to have even just that one picture of the, the pickle station. Now, there are several pictures here. There was a guy who um, had taken a bunch of pictures back in the, in the 40s, I think it was. And um, one of the guys in the Sioux Line Circle said, well, David Leiter, he bought all his pictures, Neil Torcell's pictures, and he let me copy them from, from those. Because he was working on that with Pack on his railroad book that's together with that. And so that's how come these are in here. So I, a lot of them you can see were old postcards and stuff. Some belong to Stork Society and, and some to me. But these are from him. There's an REA truck backed up there. And the passenger train. Yeah, the brick platform. And that's the brick we still have, but we don't have as much anymore because so much of it was taken from here. So, and it, you know, we don't have it going down. That brick platform, I measured the distance because you could tell where the curves were on the end. It was exactly 500 feet long. Wow. It went right from the edge of the bridge, way down that way. Because wow. the curve was still there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And you look down toward that end, you look, go down, you look down the hill, and there's a lot of cinders there. They must have cleaned out the <laughs> ashes or any cinders a little bit on the ends when they stopped there once in a while. I'm sure they did. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Like yeah. And they're stopped there with the, you know, for passengers or freight or baggage. Now that's a little more recent picture, if you could call it recent these days. <laughs> but a lot much larger steam engine. I would say something like that, yeah. They quit having steam engines in the 50s. So. I don't know if that's one of their Pacifics. It almost looks like it's one of those that are painted gray and are light coloring on a the smoke box. I like this picture. This is taken from the, across the bridge toward the depot where the two steam engines are. I thought maybe that would be a good one to adapt into making a t-shirt for, for us here. And so we mentioned there was another railroad in Wapaka. It was originally called the Wapaka Green Bay Railroad. It was built in 1907, or 19, yeah, this was a year later, 1908, when they took the picture. But that was built because they had trouble getting enough um, cars for the potatoes, to haul potatoes. So they wanted to put in some competition for the Sioux line to get. So they built this line from Wapaka to Scandinavia. And they called it Wapaka Green Bay because it went to the Green Bay and Western in Scandinavia. That's where that name came from. Eventually they came out hard times and the Green Bay and Western bought them out, so it did become part of the Green Bay and Western and it lasted until I think um, 47, if I remember right. But they had another station here. This is what we're talking about, Wapaka stations. I thought I'd include the other ones. But this was right, if you were well, going down State Street and across Mill Street into the foundry property there, that this was where that was. And it was originally a, a church, a Danish Lutheran church, wasn't it? And it was remodeled into the train station. So that's, I remember when that station was still there and the, the foundry tore it down. 
So when they tore it down, they put a nice plaque there where the station was, but even that plaque is gone now, so yeah. This is the, uh, the back end of it. Look at the age of that engine. That, even when that picture was taken, that was a really old engine. <laughs> you know, they, they had to buy all the used equipment to get the railroad going. Yeah, that's an American style engine. That's, that's obviously from the 1800s, maybe the 18, even the 1860s, you know, Civil War time had engines that looked like that. And so it's Did that line, it did, and uh, which you'll soon see. Yeah, in fact, the last picture too. There is a passenger car, and there was one of their passenger cars that existed out in the field, out direction, until just a number of years ago. It was rotting away out there. Finally, it, it would disappear. Just a little bit earlier for me to to get it, and probably was in too bad a shape by then. Anyway, yeah. And since you asked about passengers, there's a, an excursion that the Danes home was taken to Green Bay. So they, they go up to Scandinavia and, and switch trains. A guy, a guy from um, Colorado sent me a picture. It was really similar to this one, but a little different pose. And he asked me if I knew what that picture was. And I said, that sure looks familiar. So I looked at it, and it was the same people standing there in the same train, just from a different angle. So, yeah. And I don't know exactly where that is. It's you know somewhere between Quebec and Scandinavia. That's all I know. Okay, then the other railroad is the trolley, which went from the depot here and out to the out to the Grandview Hotel and it stopped at the Veterans Home. This is the Wisconsin Veterans Home Station, right along with Double Q now. Yeah, right in over in there, not far from where, yeah, where um, King Road comes out. So this picture I got from uh, somebody from Wild Rose, and they said that was, one of those guys was their grandfather, and he was a Civil War veteran, and those were all Civil War veterans. So that people ended up, when the trolley line was discontinued, they moved that into the cemetery over at the Veterans Home, and they used it as a storage building in the cemetery. And then, again, fairly recently, but, but everything is, <laughs> I'm getting older. <laughs> Things that seem recent for me, it wouldn't be for Anna. <laughs> anyway, they, they, um, they quietly tore that down without telling anybody about it. Yeah, so I hadn't heard from some of the other people that worked there. And so they, they purposely didn't want anybody to know they were tearing it down. <laughs> that wouldn't have been a neat building to save. It's just this little tiny yeah. fancy building. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and this is at the Grandview Hotel, which is just around the bend, up the hill and around the bend on the lake. So this was the, their newer car, car 19 they bought. And so they had a neat little platform there, open platform with, with all the fanciness on it. So if, again, if I had my, my way into anything I wanted to, I would build that platform, because we have the trolley car in the, in the building there. So I'd lay track across, across the driveway and into the yard right there, and then I'd put that building, maybe, maybe a little smaller, but in proportion, you know. And that would be, I'd have both ends of the trolley line. The end with the car bar, which is this end, and the other end, which is the Grand Hotel. But just going across the driveway. Yeah. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? Yeah. And then we could, if we wanted to, there people could have music down there and they could sit on the hillside. Anything. Wait, is that the car in No. This is, this is a double truck car. We just have the, freight, the baggage car. Single truck car. This is what, one of the cars they bought new. Yeah, car number 19. And anyway, that guy there, see him standing there, the guy with the, to the le on the left side, would, they both had hats and they had coats. Yeah, the bigger guy was shorter. Yeah, anyway. It does, but anyway, this is his coat. Oh, right here, we got it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, he's got 
three brackets on each side, and I can put all the different tickets in there. What you do? So, yeah, there's more brackets on the inside. Yeah, yeah. Was there anything in? You got it? No. But we did get a bunch of other stuff along with it. Like I got some, what looked like Civil War hats, which were from, what was that, Tracy? You're trying to remember the name of the group. The Knights of Pythias. Knights of Pythias, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And there were some other things, too. And one of his band, uniforms, he was in the back of the band, he was a big band. So there was a, parts of a band uniform there, too. And they're all in the trunk down below. The guy that had it, he wanted, he wanted, he brought, he wanted us to get this old trunk. He was interested in that trunk. And so we go out to his house just to look at it. He didn't know if he wanted another trunk. <coughs> and we open up the trunk, and here's all this stuff in it. And he goes, oh, I didn't know there was anything in there. <laughs> so he gets out this big garbage bag. He's going to throw all this stuff away. Oh, no. So he said, no, no, just leave everything in there. So we got all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, this picture here, my mom can tell you who, who was the guy on the right. That's. He says, um, my father was on the draft board, and they were seeing the guys off on the board, or board or whatever. And so Lindsay from Manawa and uh, Larson, I can't remember his first name, but Larson. Larson Roller, and then my dad was there. Elmo. The draft board. Elmo, or Elmo, yes. That's the only thing I really do. Two people have a relation to that picture. The one on the right was also that. The one on the right was also that. This is my grandfather. My, my father was Bill Millions. He had the board of drafts in the back. So is that elbow in the middle there, Carol? Uh, is that elbow in the middle? Yeah. I don't know. 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 I don't Steam train through here. He took a video from the back of the train 
and he was selling copies of that to raise money to, to help us get the info. So, so yeah, he was, and his, he lives in Chicago, but his family has a cottage on the chain, you know, like so many. Yeah. So he comes up here a lot in a special place, you know. And his good friend was David Leiter, the one that wrote that other book. And he would bring him up together, and that's how David got involved. But anyway, John died pretty young, and I'm not sh sure just why it was a sudden thing. Maybe it was a heart attack or something, I don't know. But he passed away, and it was like a day later when, when this railroad said we could buy the people. <laughs> so it was really interesting. Wow. Yeah, it's like, it's like he was there. To, Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what year do you hear that? For this picture? Yeah. You know, I'm not really sure. That car looks like it was an old yeah. car at that time. Right. Right. And I think the car behind is a little newer. That's why I'm guessing these are 40s. 40s or 50s or something. 50s. No, I'm not even sure um, yeah. if one of those is John. And he, he might have told me that I can't remember. He was the kid there in that picture. I think it's like a silent dress or whatever. Yeah. 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 There's a semaphore up there, the, the train order signal. And Lane knows about, about those. The ones, we're, we're working on two of them. And when you leave down by the bottom of the hill, the ones lit up. It's a train order signal. And so is this one. Now, this, that's a semaphore. They're for a little different purpose. This is one that goes by the station, the weather is supposed to. Stop the station or not, but they're similar. I'll refer this back to you, but we're looking eastbound, so that outside one on the right side would be telling the train going east to stop if it was dropped, correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that is before we go. It's up right now, I'm going to through it. I'm going to be green and at the angle is watching the. Well, right, yeah, because it's a high level. Yeah, and they had, they had different types of signals for different things. And this is an upper quadrant signal on the ones that go down, angle down, or lower quadrant signal. It, it, honestly, even to today, there are so many different kinds of signals. It is dizzy when you think about it. Like the, the, sig the signal books for the yeah. conductors and engineers, there's like 17 different kinds of signals in service, obviously. And they're still, yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it gets kind of confusing to me. The early pictures, the, sound, the, the post was in between the two tracks. But then they moved it up and they went through the roof of the depot, right up close to the depot. And that's where it rotted so bad and the roof had a big hole in it because the semaphore was gone from there. So the office was really in bad shape. Now this is Neil Torcell and Neil's son is Keith who lives in Brent in Marshfield. So he had this picture of his dad who was a traveling agent, you know, went around to different places at uh, his younger years. Yeah. And here he is in the packet at the people. So you yeah, let me copy that picture. Mm -hmm. Is that me? Yeah, yeah. Talking uh, <laughs> yeah. about cigarettes, yeah. when I started refacing that color there, the mm -hmm. different color, mm -hmm. there's all these bird marks on it. Ah. Yeah, like that. Like, well, that's the only way they get cigarettes now. Yeah. And then the bird. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff in there in those old pictures. I got some more. This is a 1960, I know that picture. Got that on that one. So we tried to lay out the office basically like that picture the most we could. So I did a few things different. There's shades they didn't put all the way to the top, but I put I put them all the way up. <laughs> And then mm -hmm. we got the little people there. Remember the back floor, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
that was about one of the only things left in here that was still here, and it was all wrecked, and it was in a hole in the floor, parts of it. So it looks like a piece of junk in there in the corner, but because it was the one thing left, yeah, <laughs> one keep thing it. Left. But maybe it could be rebuilt. I don't know. It's, it's there. So you can see the here's the the telegraph sounder with the resonator box in that box to make it sound louder. And this other cabinet here with forms. And the telephone here, the scissors telephone. Yep. Mm -hmm. And right here, this is the one thing I missed out on too. Oh. It was, it's the control for the semaphore. It went backwards. It's the control box for the semaphores outside. Mm -hmm. It's these colored lights with a switch on it. And a guy wanted them on eBay to sell it. He wanted thousands and some dollars. And and we've been, and he came back for 700 and, and we said 750 and he said forget it. So mm -hmm. I wish I would have bought it for the 750. Or he said 750 and we said 700. I forgot. But anyway, we didn't get it. And it included the actual, the yellow light, the lights outside. It wasn't just that box. Oh, it wasn't, yeah, it would have <laughs> easily been worth it. But, but I guess he didn't like it that we were negotiating. So, I'm sorry about that, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> but however, that box, I could get some colored lights and put on a three-way toggle switches mm -hmm. and make it a pretty good looking reproduction. <laughs> and I don't think we would have been allowed to put the signal up in front of the people anyway, mm -hmm. or where the track is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it's not, it's not the end of the world we're gonna get it. But you can see there's so much stuff in there. There's a board, these are the relays for the telegraph. There are four telegraph lines. And the, and the relays, well, this thing flips so easy. Yeah. There's four telegraph lines that came into the depot. And so the relays are always, it's like a party line. And the relays are always pounding out the messages kind of quietly. And then the Wapak had its own signal, like the call letters. And so in the back, of the, the guy's working away, and then all of a sudden he hears in the back of this, the, the whole pack of call letters. So then he plugs in this patch box, and it switches the sound to the louder sounder right here. And that's when they would communicate. Man, that thing, I hardly touch it. Well, we'll go to this one. See, there's, and there's um, Louis Siebert, who worked here for many, many years, and that's him with his telegraph key. They all had their own telegraph keys. And you can see the sound there with a, there's a velvet tobacco box in there. All the pictures of the railroad officers yeah. with a sound there and a resonator box, they always have a tobacco tent in there to make it even louder, oh. you know, to kind of think of that sound. Metal the metal box in there, yeah. So we have a velvet tobacco tent in there sound there. <laughs> yeah. So, we got a Prince Albert one too, but since I said velvet, I got to put that in there. So at, at that time, you must have had some other hardboard or some top on there and it filled in a little bit. And you can see that light that came down on the arm, like that, so. And all the forms, that's why I just put a picture of a form in there. This is a 419, which is a really common form. And this one's not even a Sioux line one, but it shows you what some of the paperwork that was in there. This is what they would hand up to the trains that going by when the train order signal. And then, I don't know, there was different, then all the passenger trains, you know, there was lots of different passenger trains, especially early on. Over the years, it changed around some. But I kind of researched the best I could, and this is kind of the, the main progression of the trains that, were in, that went through Wapaka. So, you know, early, it's kind of some of those early premier trains from Chicago to Minneapolis trains, one and two. You know, and as things changed, it became a long distance local, writing the mail, coach and vet and cafe service. It was a day schedule with the train operated legally between Chicago and Minneapolis. So that would be one that would stop here. But at first it was a, the high speed mainline train, but then it changed. And then that's changed. This is the train number. The train's going north were the odd numbers, one, three, and the train going south were the even numbers, going two, four, 
So the next one is Chicago to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and on to Vancouver, Washington, via the Canadian Pacific. Because the line didn't go that far. However, you could get on one train and it would continue all the way through. Later it became 13 and 14 was routed on the northwestern between Chicago and well, Mesopotamia, I didn't know that. Twin Cities. And the summer was called the Mountaineer and the winter of the Sioux Dominion. So because, because this was a high speed, long distance train, it's a shorter route on the northwestern than it is on the Sioux line. So that's why in order to pe and get people over the quickest, they went on that route. So I didn't go through here later on. And then overnighter from Chicago, Ashland cars were switched out. Spencer, the booth, cars at Owen, and the remaining portion entered Twin Cities. And then my mom talks about remembering the switching the, the cars around at, right, Owen, at Owen forever. And she was taking the train. <laughs> yeah, so that would be that train. But then as things changed, you know, then the Laker was the last one. It was that was the very last train and passenger train that ran on the Suai. So and it was an overnight train, so it always stopped here in the middle of the night. The trains had their own logos, or drum heads as they were called, on the back of the passenger train, so I just copied a few of them. Those drum heads are um, lighted in the back and like on the back of the train, mm -hmm. and they're really collectible. They're hard to get. There's a big collection of them at the museum in Green Bay. So. Mm -hmm. Although we have a reproduction drum head in our Milwaukee Road caboose so that looks like this, so it looks kind of neat. It's just an original one. And this is a schedule for the Laker. I'm not going to go over all that. <laughs> but that's the, that's the final train that came through here. And this is a picture of a Sioux Line steam train. However, I think this one was a, a special train or something. Excursion train of some sort. But it, it shows the the Pacific engines, the, the Sioux engines and the cars they had, the style of cars. This is actually the, the Laker in Fond du Lac. So this will actually be one of the trains that stopped here. Now you look at that car, the, the train, and there's one, two, three baggage cars and two passenger cars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what kept the trains in business was when they had all the mail service and that kind of stuff. It was, it was really the mail that kept the trains going as long as it did. That's why there's so many mail cars. And this is another, he's a railroad artist, but this is a photograph of his. The same train in Waukesha. And then I looked around the internet and I saw, found some pictures of the interior of the Sioux Line cars. Now, when you, when you see pictures of these streamlined passenger trains going across the country, you know, and all that, that wasn't the Sioux Line. <laughs> <laughs> they never did have streamlined passenger, high-speed passenger cars. But they did, were well known that they kept their cars maintained and kept them clean. And so even, even though they didn't have the high-speed trains, so people wouldn't, they're going across the country, weren't going to take this longer route this way and around when they could go on the Milwaukee Road, which went over 100 miles an hour, and, and, and you know, Northwestern and the, and the other railroads that went, had a shorter route to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So there is a sleeper car where the, the top would come down and there'd be bursts there, and, and the bottom would spread out for some more, more bed. Another, yeah, three of them car. And there's a well, there's a dining car, a coke car, a lunch car. And all the big ashtrays, yep. Yep. Everybody smokes. Yeah, those are ashtrays. <laughs> yep. Things change. And the last passenger train go back on January 16th, 1965. The day I put on the train bulletin board up there, the Laker, the conductor there, the train came in the middle of the night. Yeah. Now these are old newspaper pictures. And believe it or not, I was 10 years old at that time. 
And I got those pictures out of the newspaper and saved them. Oh. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> wow. I was doing a scrapbook. <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and there's some of the people. The the yeah. If you know Don Schmidt from the Red Mill, that's his parents. Oh, 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 oh my gosh. Here. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, Sterling Schrock. Yeah, Sterling Yeah. Sterling Schrock is also going up for sale. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Moving into one of the places behind the bedroom home. I mean, behind, behind Bethany. And his barn had a whole bunch of potato crates in it. Oh, so when I was going to do the potato program the other day, I was going to bring a few of those crates and oh, yeah. set them in here along with some of the other potato stuff we have. But that's for another year or day or something. Because <laughs> so we have some of the potato crates from the storage shops farm. <laughs> and there's an old parlor organ in there. I could get for free one. I told them, but I don't know where to put it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, there's the records of the final train of the lake. And again, we don't need to read all the old stuff. This is interesting. I talked about all the mail on the passenger train. Well, for a number of years, they had this extra cover, cover in there where they put the mail carts, the baggage carts that were loaded with mail to protect them. It only lasted less than 10 years that roof covered in before they tore it down and the passenger train was gone. But when we got the depot, the, the park that went behind the platform was extended and it was blacktop. It's on the west side. Yeah, we're facing toward that direction. And that black top was still there, but it was getting in pretty bad shape. So we needed the parking area worse, so I took out, dug out that last of that black top. And then there was a wood edge, and I used that wood for the edge of the platform in the car barn down there to make the platform for the car barn. It was this big, heavy beam. So. And here we are. This is one more recent picture of it. All of the study from not only the railroad steam engines, but the foundry made lots of soot in those days. I don't know when it was, but it was well. It was still, no, it was earlier than that because it was still in operation. The windows are open, the doors open. When they closed it down, they boarded everything up. And there's still two tracks. And yeah, well, that was way before. So yeah. this was sometime before '87, and those two tracks were gone in 2004. I think it was. Yeah. So yeah. But yeah, all the foundry soot. Remember the foundry used to, used to be able to see the fire come out of the people on and, and the whole town would be black in the winter the snow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how much that foundry soot and how much steam engine soot and just from over the years. But it certainly looks a different color. So People remember the people here say, oh, it's all a different color than what I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you, you remember when I read about the early people, all the woodwork was green when they first started. But the sewer line painted it the, the maroon color. And they painted the walls inside where it's green now, cream color, and the, all the woodwork was painted brown. Wow. Where it's all, all the woodwork, we stripped all that and reformed wow. it. But I went, it, see now I did, I did something, I did the sewer line ear on the outside and I was kind of separate ear on the inside, but I couldn't see not having this nice woodwork showing. So, and then everybody remembers the room outside, so I left that. That's kind of what you can do what you want, you know, you get a little leeway. So there's four depots built of, this, of the same style as this depot. There's the one here. And this one's in Marshfield, mm -hmm. and it's built with the same stone. Well, it was slightly longer because it had a bigger baggage room, but it was built on the same plans and everything. I got the drawings. And when they quit using that, well, they were going to rebuild the highway in Marshfield, and the depot was in the way of the highway, so the state had the depot moved. It was a, this, this stone building, you know, so it's possible to move one. And then they moved it across the street. And it ended up being made into this oriental restaurant. But this is the side that had the porch on. Those shorter, those little windows way in the center, that's where the two doors were. They closed those all up. 
And they, they took out the fireplaces, those are gone. And instead of having a tile roof, it's got a shingle roof. So here's the other side of it. So I feel like we really, really kept ours more original. They took out the walls. See, now you're, we're sitting right looking in the same direction as that picture. Those three windows together are the windows right there. And those other smaller windows are the, are the bathroom windows. And see, the, the fireplace is gone and the walls are gone and everything's changed. So now it's that oriental room. When I was there taking pictures of it, there was nobody else there but the guy that owned the restaurant and got mad because I was taking pictures. <laughs> so I had to leave. <laughs> I kicked out of the restaurant, even though it was open and there was nobody else there. The, the, the head waitress told me it was okay. She, the head hostess, she said sure, but then the owner came along. <laughs> so, this is Stanley. Again, it's the same design as Opaca. This is the second one that's more similar. It hasn't been remodeled that much. When, the, when we bought this one, the, there was a group of Stanley that was also negotiating to buy that one. So that got sold to the local group there about the same time. Now, in Stanley, they didn't, we put a tile roof back in on it. It's a simulator one. They just shingled their roof. And then, then they put the fence up, which we were required to have the fence, too. But I've been there a number of times since, the last time a couple of years ago, and they haven't done any more with it than put on that roof on the fence. The inside was still all in bad shape. They still had the double doors. Ours was bricked up into a single door. And we, we restored it back to the double doors. But, but here they still have the original doors on that one. Now this is um, Ladysmith. This is the fourth people. Was, like I said, there were four. And this one's still used by the railroad. They use it for an office. <laughs> so again, this is the side that would have the porch on. The portico in the drawing, it's called. And that's gone, and it's got the shingle roof. And the windows are changed around. Like I say, they still use it, so they put modern windows and everything. So that's changed a lot since the days of the... Yeah. Yeah, the, the baggage room door was made smaller, and it's just a single door there. And, but that's still in use. So. There's from the other direction, the side of the bay window. One thing that they do have in Ladysmith is they have a bunch of Sulay passenger cars there. Mm -hmm. The historical group there, or so, whatever group it is, has several of these cars all in line in a row. So they got all some of the original Sulay passenger cars, which is pretty neat. I was able to go inside. And they have an engine, too, an F unit. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> and then they also have a steam engine in town, not near mm -hmm. this. But. Wow. So yeah, they, there were, uh, a few years ago there was a tornado through there and a bunch of these passenger cars got turned over in the tornado. Mm -hmm. So they had to put them back up. And they said that some of the frames got twisted during the tornado and they flipped over. Mm -hmm. So up until then they were, they were restorable, you know, maybe with a little work, but now with the twisted frames, it'd be pretty hard to ever restore them and get one running. So this is Wapaka after I bought the freight house. No whole story of buying that. How much time we got? It's been an hour already, so I better keep going. <laughs> wow. This is what it looked like just before we bought it. No, this is when they were taking out the bridge. I was working on the roof of the great house. I was getting ready to take out the bridge. Okay. This, wow. is, this is after they put the bridge in, but before we got it. So this is like the last picture before. So this is how bad it was by the time we got it. Mm. Yeah, it was in this picture. We had the new track there. So, so that's basically what we had to start with. <laughs> Inside the office, all the lot of stuff. And these were in 2000. We didn't buy it until 2004, so it was even worse by then. Broken glass and everything. It's right what we're looking at right now. Yeah. Replacing some of the soffit material. We had soffit custom made. A friend of Linda's did that, Larry. 
He made a mill net just for it, so we could make the exact same type of soffit to match. And we had to, you know, take out all. We had 2,000 feet of soffit we put in with all the back areas. You can see it was all rotten under there. And we had to take out the rods, go back to good wood, and then tie it together. Friend of mine, I'm putting up the new station sign. The guy in Plymouth had the original one. He didn't want to part with it. And the other guy, and the guy from from. Um, well, near Wapun had the other one. Mm. So, but now I can make brand new ones. I feel good about leaving outside. <laughs> we really like the brick. Working on it. Yeah, looking for Yeah. So. Beautiful. And we built the car barn. Another time we'll talk about the trolley line. And we got the caboose from Jim Taylor who donated it to us. He had that in his yard. He had it all fixed up inside. He was getting so he had to, he was getting out of years and had to find a good home for it, so he gave it to us. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Way in the end, there's a picture of the inside. Yeah. And so now we got events here. Not quite so many now since it's cold. Yeah, yeah some, of you, some of you are in this picture. Wait. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow. Not only if they don't have the weddings here, they come up here and take pictures. Yeah. There's so often I'm coming I hear coming here and there's people taking pictures for <laughs> high school senior pictures and different things. Oh. It's really popular for that. It's nice to hear both of the I'm so excited to come up here and get pictures. <laughs> he was here this last week. The person who was yeah. taking pictures wanted to have some pictures inside, so I opened up for him. And we did some. And old car club here. See, there's the inside of that of that house. That's a little gathering. Yeah, this was after the um, musical at the middle school had some of the leaders from the from the musical, the teachers that were in charge of it had a little party after the last one. All right. <laughs> it wasn't a cast party, obviously. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the trolley line, I think that's another whole thing. There's oh. eight, July 4th, 1899, the first day the trolley ran. July 4th, 1999, the first day it ran again after we restored the car. <laughs> it's taken in the same spot. Yeah. It's 100 years ago, 100 years. Later to the day. Wow. And we get collections of interesting railroad things. This is some of the Sulai China. Mm -hmm. Railroads had their own China patterns. And mm -hmm. So we saw some of the pictures inside the cars. So we have like 200 pieces of railroad China here. Yeah. It's really highly collectible. Mm -hmm. That's called a Logan pattern. And uh, inside the, uh, what was the men's smoking room later became the office, and office, another office. <laughs> and we got the ATCS stuff. And that's Tom Holly's roll top desk. And again, people that remember just a few years ago, we'll pack it, Tom Holly was a very well-known person in we'll the So this was not the desk he had at the funeral, but this is the one he had in his house. And when he was moving to Arizona, he donated that to us here. So this room had become an office anyway. Mm -hmm. So now we have an office still. And there's my caboose. Wow. Moving that across the street. I bought that in 81 and we moved it. Well, after I bought the freight house, we could move it over here. Because I had it five miles out of town on a friend's. <laughs> and this way I could move it closer to my own property. So. I've never seen that up there. Ellen Santa? Yeah, I yeah. What's that caboose doing there? Then I came over here. And then I moved over here. <laughs> And then we, we sometimes have good meals in the caboose. <laughs> but now we got it all, it was, I was stripping it then, because the paint was peeling so bad. So now I got it all stripped and repainted. It looks really nice inside. And Malachi. Yeah, one of the basements. I guess. Oh, there it is. There it goes. 
So in 2015, we put it in the basement. We dug it out. There was Jeff. He disappeared. Look at that. Go back the other way. Well, you saw it. <laughs> yeah, for a second. Yeah, for a second. So it took us six months to dig out the basement by hand. With buckets and shovels. And we had a conveyor. Yeah. Yep, we poured the floor. Falls Concrete did the, did the floor, did the cement. We did the digging, and they did that part of it. So there's a Canadian National Train, and that's a really, that was a great place for real fans to come and see the trains go by. Because this redepot is, is really rare as far as museums go, because mostly railroads don't allow the depots to be sold and left so close to the track. Mm -hmm. So either the either the track is gone, the railroad's been abandoned, or you're required to move it. And after four years of negotiation, we finally got this people without knowing it. So yeah. it's, it's a popular place. Well, that's because they moved the tracks. Yeah. They moved the track slightly. Yeah. That was their reason that they moved the track okay. to the center of the main line from the edge. So it was moved like eight feet over. Then I got one other thing if I can get this to come on that I want to show you. And it's right here. This guy up here, Max and Ron, they're working on a, a movie about the people, a professionally made movie. And this is their trailer, it's just a couple minutes. Well, I'm hoping that somebody actually wants to continue maintaining the building. I hope the next week a train doesn't come through and train records, but it's flat and all the way Yeah. We can so very easily argue that the railroads are a tool that we use to build our country. There are cities that would not exist if the railroads had not come through. Welcome to this episode of That's What's Happening with Africa. We are back at the railroad depot. You did, you've done a lot of fixing up here. Yeah, Mike, as far as I can remember, he was always into model railroad. He he could do anything. Um, we lost our father when um, he was 16 and I was 14, and he had learned from our father to work on things and fix things and build things, and so he was really good at that. Pretty frequently, hear about another duplo being demolished somewhere that wasn't able to be saved. The guys in my back and window on the opposite side of the train. Two legs and everything was getting lost. So it's kind of nice to be able to say something. Yeah, there was a time in our country where there was literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of relatives. Survival of the fittest economically was taking place. Yeah. Yeah. And or a regional entity now became part of a big corporation. Wow. And so that little small local depot, it, it just goes away. They wanted this one bulldozed along with the trade house. It was going off. So Mike got the, both of them. He, he saved both of the buildings. So it was kind of cool. It was worse than I, than I knew. And then that big hole in the floor up there. And the walls were all black and sprayed with graffiti. Yeah, I said, well, it doesn't look like we're ready to paint this yet. Did you love them Okay. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a lot of stuff oh, yeah. that I didn't make it as nobody back to the way it is. It's something that should be preserved. It should be remembered. It's saving a part of history. Oh, yeah. Every time we go down the basement, we go down and say, we really think this all out by hand ourselves. It not only tells the story of the railroads, but it tells the story of us as a country and, and as a people.